Greetings brothers and sisters and this is the Gospel Sounders bringing to you the continuation of the series uh, The Latter Rain and uh, I'm sorry first of all I want to apologize for not being able to present on the Sabbath, Sunday, Monday and Tuesday because of uh, some circumstances but uh, i really appreciate the name of the lord once again to be able to bring you this session gospel sounders is uh, a ministry based in kenya geared towards the spreading of the three angels messages to the whole world and uh, we are praying that uh, the lord will bless us as uh, we go through the session of today i believe that uh, we are living in the most solemn time of this world's history and uh, we need to have an anger we need to hold on to jesus christ we need to be sure that our names are still for the courts above and not only that but also we are saved so that we may bring others to the truth and uh, we may be able to show others what Christ is really doing in our lives and so I just want to say that uh, the times we are living in are not the times of fear but there are times for reconsecration to the lord there are times for re-examining ourselves and uh, seeing really are we walking according to the light that we have received or is there anything still holding us so that we may be able to give our hearts fully unto Christ. He may work his marvelous light into our hearts. And so, welcome Brother Robert Ken, And uh, welcome Unru. Whatever you are watching from, I know the Lord will bless us. This is the number 15 in the series, the Lateran series. The other presentations you can watch on my page. And today we are going to deal with the true nature of the shaking. The true nature of the shaking. And so I'd like us to pray as we enter into the presentation of today and uh, open our hearts so that uh, the Lord may speak unto us what he wants to speak to the church. Let us pray. You can take the position that you can as we pray. Abba Father in heaven, what can we say such a vessels of earth, yet so precious in thy sight, that you even send thy son to die for us? Out of this miry clay, Lord, you find pure gold that you make vessels for thy sanctuary to work for thy service and use them as you will, not as puppets, but through your love through thy wooing spirit that enables her to be turned unto thee however devilish they may be however satanic they may be lord yes we were creatures of wrath but lord thou hast ordained that we may be saved and so help us 
to give ourselves unto the Lord, for we cannot give you a heart. Only they can take it and seal it for the courts above. Give us the strength we need for living in such a time as this. Be with thy children, and as we learn of thy word, may we not just be hearers of it, but doer of it, not deceiving ourselves. And so take charge and give us of thy spirit that we may be able to comprehend the things of the Spirit. It is in Christ Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, I'd like us to study some few things together. And uh, the Lord uh, will be able to show us what we need to learn at such a time as this. The Lord is making up His uh, congregation. He is making up his church, and what he want is to be numbered among the church. So, before, I'd like us to look at something in the Bible, as uh, we even start the session of this moment, that uh, when the Lord comes, actually he shall be able to separate those who are righteous and those who are not righteous. But I want us to look at something in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians, what uh, the word of the Lord says in the book of Ephesians. And uh, I'd like us to look at something. From verses... Uh, Verses um, 22, going down to 33, 22 to 33. These are familiar verses that uh, we have read in the past. And this is where I want to start the presentation of today. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22. And the word of the Lord says, Wives, submit yourself unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the, husbands, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be subject to their own husbands in everything. I want you to see that, therefore, the church is subject to Christ. The only thing that the church can do is to be subject to Christ. And why should the church be subject to Christ? Continued on, verse 25, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved also, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So, there is the church giving itself to Christ and Christ giving himself for it. That he might sanctify and cleanse it from, cleanse it with the washing of water by the wife, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having any spot or wrinkle or any such a thing but that it should be holy and without blemish. And so, if you are going to have something which is without blemish, it means that that thing, whatever it is, it should pass through a purification. A purification, and if it's not about a purification, then it is a separation from that which is good from that which is bad and this is what we call the shaking and the sifting that has to happen into the church so that the church may remain with only a people who are subject to christ people who know that christ gave himself unto them and then the Lord himself must have a glorious church, a church which doesn't have 
tears but a church that only uh, a church that does not have weak uh, tears but ha have only wheat and so this is the analogy that is represented in the book of Ephesians chapter 25 that there is this shaking and separation the, the same thing that um, we are talking about also we can follow it in the book of Matthew chapter 25 the book of Matthew chapter 25 and let us see this uh, from verses 31 when the son of man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all nations and he shall separate we are talking about the Lord having a church a church that looks just like him and so there is a separation that has to take place yes whenever we hear of the word separation it's, it doesn't seem like a good word unto our mouths but the Lord himself has a work of separation that has to be done uh, uh, and then he shall separate them one from another this is the sifting passing through the sieve and the shaking as a shepherd divided you see that word divided also comes in that it is the work of the Lord and not a man to do it and how does the Lord do it we just read in Ephesians by his word the shaking and the sifting that has to be done it doesn't have to be done by a man telling somebody you don't belong here or you don't belong there but the word itself has to cut and not the tone or the voice of a person and so he separates the sheep and divides as a shepherd divided his sheep from the goats and he shall he shall set the sheep on his right hand but the goats on the left this is the separation that takes place and so we see that the Lord himself is the one that does the dividing and the separation and it is done by the word as the process of cleansing goes on those who accept this subjection to Christ as Christ gave himself to the church they are separated they are divided so that uh, uh, the word may do our, our work of washing and those who do not accept it may be sifted away because they wouldn't allow the cleansing from the Lord and so we must be ex expecting the great shaking that has to happen amongst God's people those who shall be allow Christ to do a work in their lives and those who actually will not allow the Lord to do uh, the work in his hand then they shall be uh, separated and uh, I, I, I want you to look uh, at another verse. I want us to look at another verse. It should be in the book of Matthew. Let me put it here. Look at the book of Matthew chapter 3. Verses 12. Matthew chapter 3 verses 12 this sifting and the shaking that has to happen in the church it says this was when John was baptizing and he talk, say, talks about I need I indeed uh, when Christ came to be baptized by Jesus Christ I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance but he that cometh after me is mightier than I whose shoes I am not worthy to there they, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire this is when uh, um, John the Baptist was in Jordan and uh, he was baptizing people and they asked him are you the Christ why are you baptizing are you the Christ or are you the prophet are you the one whom we have been waiting upon and he said no 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 no, no. In, I need I indeed baptize you with water He's, he talks about preparing the way and then he talks about the sifting and then the shaking that has to happen in the church he says that he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire whose fan is in the hand in his hand and he shall and he will thoroughly purge his flow 
and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. This is the separation and uh, the, uh, the, the dividing and the shaking and the sifting that has to happen in the church of God. We saw in Ephesians that it is done by the word, but now you see here again it is by the Holy Ghost and with fire in verses 11 of Matthew chapter 3. And so this separation is done one by the word and again by the Holy Ghost and with fire. These are the words that John told uh, the people that will have to happen in the church of Christ. And so we should be expecting this to happen as we near the end of the time. And so you look at um, some of the things happening around the world and they do not lie unto our eyes. Really we can see that time has been far spent on this earth and what the people have been waiting is actually the coming of Christ. But before the coming of Christ, God has a work to do. Let us read of this, that the signs reveal that the time is near when the Lord will manifest that his fan is in his hand. What kind of fun is this? The fun of separating the wheat from the tear. The fun that will gather uh, the harvest in the garner. And he will thoroughly purge his uh, his floor. The clean work that God is about to make. The Lord is about to turn and overturn in the institution called by his name. And so there is a work that God is going to do, Christ is going to do in his church so that it will be evident who are on his side and those who are not on his side. The straight testimony, heresies, testing truth and the Sunday test may be used by the Lord in the work but the real nature of the, uh, of the great shaking is the investigative judgment. And um, Talking about the investigative judgment and uh, what happens here, uh, I like to refer you to the book of Matthew again, where actually uh, uh, the, the people are invited in, uh, in, a, in a wedding in the book of Matthew chapter, two, uh, chapter 22. The people were invited in the wedding, but those who were invited in the wedding started to give forth excuses and uh, 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 some fairy tales that uh, it made the owner of the wedding uh, send out his servants to go to the highways and the byways to uh, call other people in. Let us read in uh, the book of Matthew chapter 22 from verse 7, from Matthew 22 from verse 7. The word of the Lord says, uh, After those who were bidden to come to the marriage did not come. He says in verse 7, But when the king heard thereof, he was wrath, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Those who were uh, told to come to the marriage, they did not come. Then in verse 28, he says that, Then saith he to his servant, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out in the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in, in to see the guest, he saw there a man which had not a wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. This is actually investigating those people who profess that they have come to the wedding with the invitation and have obeyed what the master of the wedding had put in the invitation letter. But now coming in the, uh, in the wedding, the, the, the wedding master 
or the owner of the wedding looks at the people who are coming in and ask him how come it here and you don't have a wedding garment this is the dividing and the separation the investigative judgment that has to produce a shaking and a sifting in the church then said the king to the servants bind his hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called but few are chosen so in 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 those in, in the group that the net takes in as you go fishing there is the work of investigating what has been caught up by the net and this is what is happening in the book of matthew chapter 22 and he says that many are called but few are chosen many are drawn with the net out of the waters out of their miry clay but do they continue do, do, do they appreciate they are fishing out of their muddy conditions some will want to come out i mean will will will, will feel fit to be called christians some will uh, rejoice in being part of a church yet they wouldn't want to live their lives apart this man was called to the wedding but he was not willing to take on the garment of the person uh, that had been provided but the, the the owner of the wedding he saw that no that that was not it he may come with his own garment and as we know that um, the garment reproduce is uh, the righteousness of jesus christ himself according to uh the book of uh isaiah if uh, i'm not wrong isaiah Look at Isaiah, garments represent righteousness and salvation. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, my soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. And so, as the people were uh, bidden to come to the wedding, they didn't have to come in their own accord, they didn't have to manufacture their own garments or their own righteousness they had to come in simplicity of the faith that the one who has bidden me to come to the wedding has a right robe for me and if i'm in this then i'll be accepted and so when he came there was an investigative judgment and then the sifting and the shaking and then he those who had been called they were divided and separated those who will remain in the wedding and those who will not remain in the wedding and so this is even what the lord uh, is uh, doing in our lives only the judgment can separate the wheat from the tares the chaff from the wheat the gold from the dross the wise from the foolish the false from the truth that this shifting process is is the work of judgment may be seen uh, in the passages that we have been uh, reading also when you read to the in, in the book testimonies to ministers and gospel workers page uh, 234 to 235 i'll just read a portion of it uh, testimonies to the ministers and gospel workers 234 to 235 we are told the time of judgment is a more solemn period when the lord gathers his own from among the tares those who have been members of the same family are separated a mark is placed upon the righteous the one who shall be taken his name shall uh, stand in the book of life while those with whom he associated shall have the mark of eternal separation from god and talking about this uh, this separation and uh, people being taken one from the family and another one from the family although it is uh, something that is not uh, 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 pleasing but nonetheless it must happen so that the church may be purified and the church may remain uh, may remain uh, uh, spotless yet uh, we know that um, not all the times our loved one will not walk the narrow path our families may not be able to walk this narrow path what are we supposed to do in such a uh, in such a cases where actually separation has to take and uh, when our families cannot walk along uh, among us I, i'll read some few things uh, 
I know this has to happen, but uh, how should we respond to it when the Lord is actually uh, in the business of saving His people? Uh, like us, how shall we behave with our family members? We are told we cannot serve God and the world at the same time. We must not center our affection on worldly relatives who have no desire to learn the truth. We may seek in every way while associated with them to let our light shine, but our words, our deportment, our customs and practices should not in any sense be molded by their ideas and customs. We are to show forth the truth in all our intercourse with them. If we cannot do this, the less association we have with them, the better it will be for our own spirituality. If we place ourselves among associates whose influence has a tendency to make us forgetful of high claims the Lord has upon us, we invite temptation and become too weak in moral power to resist it. We come to partake of the Spirit and cherish the ideas of our associates and to place sacred and eternal things lower than the ideas of our friends. We are, in short, living just as the enemy of all righteousness designed we should be. And this is what the enemy has been doing, that actually he has bound us with family ties that uh, uh, and uh, our interaction and our associations have not uh, been uh, uh, pleasing to the Lord. Uh, so. If you have such unbelieving families in such a time as this, we should let our lights shine to them. We should let our uh, our discourses be uh, uh, them that that will attract uh, them to to Christ. Uh, another thing that uh, I like you to see how we should treat um, our relatives who are not moving along with us. I saw that those who profess the truth should hold the standard high and induce others to come up to it. I saw that some would have to walk the straight path alone. So, some of us will have to walk the straight path alone. Their companions and children will not walk the self-denying pathway with them. What should we do? Patience and forbearance should ever characterize the lives of those lone pilgrims. Following the example of their blessed master, they will have many trials to endure, but they have a hope that makes the soul strong, that bears them up above the trials of the earth, that elevates them above scorn, derision, and reproach. Those who possess a hope like this should never indulge a harsh and kind spirit. This will only injure their own souls and drive their friends further from the truth. Treat them tenderly. Give them no occasion to reprove the cause of Christ, but never yield the truth to please anyone. Be decided, be fixed, be established, be not of doubtful, doubtful mind. Then she continues to say, but if your companions, this is from Spiritual Gifts, Volume 2, page 266. But if your companions and children will not come, if you cannot win them to yield to the claims of truth, make their lives here as pleasant as possible, for all they will ever enjoy will be this poor world. But let not your duty to them interfere with your duty to God. Pursue a straightforward course. Let nothing they may do or say provoke an angry word from you. You have a hope that will yield you consolation amid the disappointments and trials of earth. Your companions and children who will not be induced to tread the narrow, cross-bearing pathway with you have not this divine consolation. They should have your pity, for this world is all the heaven they will have. So, uh, we are in a time when actually the Lord is seeking His children to follow Him and not follow after the pattern of this world. In this time of great shifting, in this time of judgment, what example shall we be able to uh, give to uh, our families and uh, those who we are close to. And uh, another thing that I wanted just to point us to uh, is this. In this time, where actual separation is going on, uh, I'm going to read from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 162. 
Patriarchs and Prophets, page 162. Here it says that uh, we should beware of treating lightly God's gracious provisions for our salvation. There are Christians who say, I do not care to be saved unless my companion and children are saved with me. They feel that heaven will not be heaven to them without the presence of those who are so dear. But have those who cherish this feeling a right conception of their own relation to God in view of His great goodness and mercy toward them? Have they forgotten that they are bound by the strong ties of love and honor and loyalty to the service of their Creator and Redeemer? The invitations of mercy are addressed to all, and because our friends reject the Savior's pleading love, shall we also turn away? The redemption of the soul is precious. Christ has paid an infinite price for our salvation, and no one who appreciates the value of, their, of this great sacrifice or the worth of the soul will despise God's offered mercy because others choose to do so. The very fact that others are ignoring his just claim should arouse us to greater diligence that we may honor God ourselves and lead all whom we can influence to accept his love. And so, the only way to remain in the fold of Christ is to have this character that will induce others to walk the narrow pathway. The true nature of the shaking may be designed by the way that we are living. Our lives, if they will start to reflect Christ, then uh, we shall be able, our light shall be able to shine forth. We are told that the shaking shall be done by the Word and the Holy Ghost by fire. That is the purification that has to happen among God's people. In fact, in this um, uh, the, this um, purification and the shaking of the church, I, I'll just like to point you to Malachi, Malachi chapter 3. I want you to see this, verses 3 and verses 4. And he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old, and as in the former uh, um, years. And I'll come near to you uh, to judgment, and be swift witness against the sorcerers, and against the adulterers, and against false swearers, and against those that oppress the high hireling in his wages, the widows and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear not me, said the Lord host. And then when you go back, he says, Behold, I'll send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in, behold, he shall come, said the Lord of hosts. Verse 2, now look at it. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soul. So, this is the process of purging, this is the process of shaking, and this is the process of um, uh, refining. And uh, uh, we, this is a work that um, must go on, however uh, unpleasant uh, it may be to many. Uh, it must, uh, it must happen, and uh, uh, I like to look at uh, something. Yes, Isaiah chapter forty-eight. Look at Isaiah chapter forty-eight. From verses 8 to verses 11. 48, 8 to 11. Talking about the shaking, the sifting, and the purging. Yea, thou hadest not, yea, thou knewest not, yea, from that time that thine ear was not open. For I knew that thou wouldest deal very treacherous, treacherously, and wast called a transgressor from the womb. 
For my name's sake will I defer mine anger, and for my praise will I refrain for thee, that I cut thee not off. But look at verse 10. Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, even for my own sake, will I do it. For how should my name be uh, polluted, and I will not give my glory to another. And so the Lord is going to purify uh, uh, us but uh, not uh, as gold or silver but he will purify us as in the in, in the furnace of uh, uh, affliction uh, looking at this time what will ha be happening to the church I saw some with strong faith and agonizing Christ pleading with God their countenance were pale and marked with deep uh, anxiety Expressive of their internal struggle, light drops of perspiration fell from their foreheads, continued their honest cries. Some I saw did not participate. The angels of God left this, and I lost sight of them. And so, in this time of sifting and shaking, all of us must participate in it. After passing through this agonizing day of atonement experience, the Israel, the end time prophetess to the world, described the victory of the judgment. The company of guardian angels around them had been doubled those who are agonizing and those who are pouring their heart to the Lord and they were clothed with an armor from their head to their feet. They moved in exact order like a company of soldiers. They had obtained the victory. Evil angels have no power over them. I heard those clothed with the armor speak forth the truth with great power. It is the latter rain, the refreshing from the presence of the Lord, the loud cry of the uh, third angel. And so the church must be purified from its uh, uncleanness and then uh, uh, it will be able to arise and shine as it is depicted in the book of uh, Isaiah chapter 60. When the church has been purified and we have a whole wheat church, then it can be said, Arise, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. There cannot be this coming if the people uh, who are involved in judgment are still entertaining sin. And so after this shaking, after this winnowing, after this thorough sifting, then the Lord can be able to come and take his own. The Lord can come and claim his own. The gold has to be separated from the dross in the church. Chaff like a cloud will be borne away on the wind. All who assume the ornaments of the sanctuary but are not clothed with Christ's righteousness will appear in their shame of their own nakedness when trees without fruit are cut down as cumbrous of the ground. In, in fact, we are told that hold on to what you have lest you be found naked. You don't want to be found naked. You don't want to be found naked. And uh, we are told that... Uh, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 33, I think. Isaiah chapter 33 talks about um, who can be able to abide in the day of the coming of the Lord. It should be 33. Yes, Isaiah 33. From verses 5. Uh, from verse, um, yes, going down to verse 15. Let us read it. Isaiah 33, the word of the Lord says from verse 5, 
The Lord is exalted for he dwelleth on high, he hath filled Zion with judgment and righteousness. And this judgment is what we are calling sifting and uh, uh, the separation, the great work that has to go on. And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times and strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. Verse 7. Behold, their valiant ones shall cry without the ambassadors of peace shall, shall um, weep bitterly. The highways lie waste, the wayfaring men seizeth. He has broken the covenant, he has despised the cities, he regardeth no man. The earth mourneth and languisheth, Lebanon is ashamed and here hewn down. Hewn down. Sharon is like wilderness and Bashan and Carmel shake off their fruits. Now I will rise, said the Lord, now will I be exalted, now will I lift up myself. You shall conceive chaff, you shall bring forth stubble, your breath as far as shall devour you. And the people shall be as the burnings of lime, as stones cut up, shall they be burned in the fire. Hear that are far off what I have done, and ye that are near acknowledge my might. What is that the Lord has done? The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness hath surprised the hypocrite. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly, he that despiseth the gain of precious, that shaketh his hands from the holdings of bread, that stoppeth the, his ears from hearing of blood, and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. The sinners in Zion are afraid. And why are they afraid? Because a thorough work is going there, the work of judgment, but they present themselves uh, like a, a people who have, uh, who have a respect for God, but actually they do not have uh, that respect. And uh, as this sifting and the shaking goes on, actually we are told in the faith I live by, faith I live by, page 287. Just as soon the people of God are sealed in their forehead, it's not any seal or mark which can be seen, but are settling into truth both intellectually and spiritually. Just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come. This, this shaking reveals it, uh, ultimately those who are uh, sealed and those who are not sealed. This shaking reveals those who are sealed and those who are not saved. I, I want to show you something in fundamental of Christian education. Fundamental uh, of Christian education, page 289.1. Uh, this is what it says, that uh, there are many in the church who at heart belong to the world, but God calls upon those who claim to believe the advanced truth to rise above the present attitude of the popular churches of today. Where is the self-denial? Where is the cross-bearing that Christ has said should characterize his followers? The reason we have had so little influence upon unbelieving relatives and associates is that we have manifested little decided differences in our practices from those of the world. Parents need to awaken and purify their souls by practicing the truth in their home life. When we reach the standard that the Lord will have us rich, worldlings will regard Seventh-day Adventists as old, singular, straightless, and extremists. We are made a spectacle unto the world, and unto the angel, and unto men. So we have to reach a standard, and we are, say, we are told that just as soon as we reach that standard, and are sealed in the forehead, the shaking will come, and it will be able to show the world those who are on the Lord's side, and those who are not on the uh, Lord side uh, uh, how they are. When you read what used to happen on the day of atonement in uh, the book of Leviticus chapter 23, the children of Israel in such a time as this they were to afflict their souls and if they will not afflict their souls we are told in Leviticus 23-29 that for whosoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day he shall be cut off uh, uh, from among his people and so those who are just drawing uh, uh, to Christ by uh, a mere profession and pretense they will be cut off in this season of sifting and shaking and uh, uh, as this is going on what do we have to do uh, our work is found in Joel chapter 2 uh, look at the, jo the book of Joel chapter 2 
The watchmen then must blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, gather the people, call a solemn assembly, sanctify the congregation, assemble the uh, elders, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord. And as they are doing this, and their lives reflect Christ, actually they are sealed and they are separated from uh, those who are not uh, in such a uh, condition. So we must blow a trumpet in Zion, and as we blow the trumpet in Zion, the Lord says this, he will be able to mark those who are doing this work, and they, you will be separated from those who are not doing this work. This is depicted in Ezekiel chapter 9 verse 4, And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry of the abomination that be done in the midst thereof. And as they do this, they are sealed, as they blow the trumpet and sanctify the congregation and make a call for a solemn assembly, the Lord is preparing them. And when the seal goes, actually, they'll have the seal of God and they will receive the latter rain and be able to uh, uh, finish the work. And so, in such a time we are living in, as we see the times, are the signs of the time. Our deepest interest must be what is happening in the heavenly sanctuary, what is happening with the tribunal there, and uh, what Christ actually is doing, the final atonement that is going there, so that uh, we may understand that we are in the day of atonement. And the, the, the kind of sacrifices that the Lord only accepts is a broken heart. A contrite heart, so he says in the book of Isaiah. And when the people uh, cry unto him, he'll be able to hear. We must understand that uh, uh, our sins are to go beforehand, and the Lord must purify us. Christ must clothe us with his own righteousness so that we may survive the judgment. We may be able to go through the safety. Where shall our mercy and hope lie? Our mercy and hope lies only with God. He is our defense. As he was a defense for Joshua in the book of Zechariah before the angel who was accusing him, so also our lives we can be able to give to Christ. But uh, the problem, where is the problem? As we even see things going on and we see the end time uh, uh, stilly uh, 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 dawning on us and uh, probation lingering on us, there is something that uh, instead of surrendering ourselves, we fail to come to that point of yielding. And this is where many people will be lost. This is where many people will lose their life. We are told in uh, 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 Steps to Christ 43. Steps to Christ 43, paragraph 3. Steps to Christ 43, paragraph 3. It says, The warfare against self is the greatest battle that was ever fought. The yielding of self, surrendering all to the will of God, requires a struggle, but the soul must submit to God before it can be renewed in holiness. So, this warfare that has to be the greatest warfare that has ever been fought amongst God's people, it is the warfare of surrendering our will to the will of God, nothing else. But many people come short of doing this. And uh, look at this, uh, Steps to Christ, page 47, paragraph 2. The only thing we have is desires for goodness. But desire for, desires for goodness and holiness as, are uh, the desires of goodness and holiness are right as far as they go. But if we stop here, they will avail nothing. Many will be lost while hoping and desiring to be Christians. They do not come to the point of yielding the will to God. They do not now choose to be Christian. Now, that, that is something that is amazing. That uh, people will desire to be saved, but no. They do not come to a point uh, that uh, they give their self to Christ so that they may uh, uh, be sealed with uh, uh, the robe of righteousness that comes from God. And so, 
Let us come out of these desires to be saved. No, desires to be saved will never help us in anything. We must come to a point in this day of atonement where we have to yield everything to Christ. And we know that uh, Christ uh, sanctified himself for those who he will be able to save. And so there is a work going on in the sanctuary above. There is a judgment that is going on and the, the names are accepted, names are rejected. There is a bloating of sin. And the high priest is making, making an atonement. And what is this atonement? Applying the merits of his blood. Giving us his spirit. So that uh, we may not uh, have a carnal spirit. We are in the last days, brothers and sisters. What we do, we must do it first. The yielding to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And uh telling the Lord to do what he can do with our lives. And so, in closing, uh, I'd like to say this, that uh, the, the shaking must happen. But the children of God have to be happy because it is not them who live. They are crucified with Christ and it is Christ who lives in them. That is what Paul says in Galatians. I think in Galatians or Philippians. Us not, but Christ in us, the hope of glory. Colossians 1.27 And so, the judgment is not a terrible ordeal to the righteous, but it is a terrible ordeal to unrighteousness. For the righteous are on the side of God, but the unrighteous will face a shaking and a sifting away. So, in closing, I'd like to uh, read from the book of Romans chapter 8. As I close, Romans chapter 8, this is the good place to end this presentation of the shaking, the real nature of the shaking. Therefore, there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. And so, who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit? We allow the spirit to take over. We allow the spirit to live. For they are that are after the flesh do not mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God, and they will be overtaken by the shaking and the sifting. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of us. These are some of the things that have to happen in our life. We are not under the law but we are under grace in that the person who is under the law uh, is carnally minded and he cannot be subject unto the law of god but the person who ha who is under the grace he have received the spirit of christ and then he is able to fulfill the righteousness that the lord demands for uh we are told that uh, those who walk in this, the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but the spirit. Those who are under the grace, they have received the spirit and so they are not under the law but they are obedient to the law because the spirit reproduces the righteousness of the law.
and it is fulfilling us whose spirit the spirit of Christ himself and so we are, although we are under the grace Grace teaches us to live soberly in the present days, denying all ungodliness. That is Titus chapter 2 verse 11. And when we receive the Spirit of God, we can be sure, uh, as it says in 2 Corinthians 3.17. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face beholding as in glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as the Spirit of uh, the Lord. When, when we look at the nature of the shaking, it is a great ordeal that has to happen to the church, the separating of the wheat from the tears. But when we receive the Spirit of Christ, we have this liberty, we have this freedom that we shall not be condemned, but the judgment shall be for us and not against us. And we stop looking at self and we start looking unto Christ. And when we look unto Christ, we are changed from glory to glory. And so, may the Lord be with us. May He continue guiding us and uh, uh as we shall be looking at the next presentation, the bride, I, I know this will be interesting to look at it. May we think of the nature of the judgment, the nature of the shaking and the sifting, and how can we pass through it? We can only pass through it when we are on the Lord's side. He is able to give us the spirit that can be able to endure the shaking that has to come to the church. When we have the spirit of Christ, then we are sealed for eternity. In fact, uh, uh, let me just read two verses. So, Ephesians chapter 1, I think it should be verse 13. Yes, in whom, in whom he also trusted after that you had the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, in whom after, also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit spirit of promise so after receiving the word of truth the gospel of salvation we are sealed with the holy spirit of promise ephesians chapter uh, ephesians chapter 4 verse 30 then we are told and grieve not the holy spirit of god whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption so my point that i was making in second corinthians um 3 17 and 18 is that when we receive this spirit of uh, of promise the holy spirit of redemption we are at liberty we don't have to fear the shaking we are hidden in christ we are clothed with the garment of his righteousness not woven with any wand or loom of human devising but the righteousness of Christ himself, as Isaiah 6, 1, verse 10 says. And so, God bless us, wherever we have been, and uh, may we continue walking in him, may we continue yielding unto him, and uh, may he prepare us to face the most troublous time that are with us here. We shall be looking how close we are to the end times, just before we finish the latter end series, and we are not far away. From the closing scenes of this world and uh, whatever you do think about uh, others think about spreading the three angels messages to the world let your light reflect and uh, how is um, your light to reflect this um, uh, closing sentiments are just good uh, how are we the message must go to the whole world uh, the last race, uh, that is Christ Object Lessons, page 416, paragraph 1. That is the last thing I'm reading on the screen. The last race of merciful life, the last message of mass to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. The children of God are to manifest his glory in their own life and character. They are to reveal that the grace of God, what the grace of the of God has done them. The light of the Son of Righteousness is to shine forth in good works, in words of truth, and deeds of holiness. So may the Lord keep you, and uh, may the Lord be with you, as uh, we shall continue learning to.
together and uh, uh, receiving of the light that he wants us to receive. Uh, uh, the shaking is not something that uh, should worry us, but it is something that should awaken us so that we may reflect Christ, we may seek him no more. Not for fear of being lost, not for the joy of being saved, but for vindicating his character because before we loved him, he loved us and died for us. Let us uh, pray. Heavenly Father, thou that loveth us with an everlasting love, we thank you, Lord, for we know that you are doing a work of judgment in this era that we are living in. And we give, Lord, ourselves unto thee. We ask you that you may take our hearts because we cannot give it. Lord, that it may be surrendered and sealed for thy courts above. It is always prone to wonder. We pray that uh, you may give us the stillness and the peace, the truest peace that cometh from thee alone. And so, be with us and guide us in our daily lives. May you, uh, may we shine and reflect you in our lives. Let uh, thy word take hold of our frontal lobes that we may not yield to anything else but to Christ alone. Continue guiding us into thy path of righteousness. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, thank you, brothers and sisters, uh, in uh, for joining in. And uh, I feel compelled to, to read something to us just uh, in this closing. Allow me to read you something as we close. That is, uh, it is uh, lift, him, uh, uh, lift Him Up, page 266, paragraph 2. Uh, I think uh, this is so important. Uh, I felt urged to read it uh, as uh, I end this session. It says, uh, we are to reflect the character of Jesus everywhere, whether in the church, at our homes, or in social intercourse with our neighbors. We should let the lovely image of Jesus appear. This we cannot do unless we are filled with the, his fullness. If we would become better acquainted with Jesus, we should love him for his goodness and excellence, and we should desire to become so assimilated to his divine character that all who will know that we had who will know that we had been with Jesus and learned of him uh, the last say, statement says that um, if we will become better acquainted with Jesus we should love him for his goodness and excellence and we should desire to become so assimilated to his divine character that all will know that we have been with Jesus and learn of him. May everyone who meet you, may everyone who comes your way really uh, realize that you have been with Jesus. Otherwise, may the Lord bless us.